I was born in Birmingham, Alabama in 1946. My dad was a meat packer. My mom was a teacher. I had an older sister named Sandra, but we all called her Anne. I was a happy and curious child. I loved school. I loved school so much that when I wasn't in school, I played school. <laughs> My parents really thought that education was the key to success and having a successful life. But this was Birmingham, Alabama, the Jim Crow South of the 1940s and 50s, and I was, still am, black and female. <laughs> we lived with the segregation, the bombings, with the efforts that were made to suppress voting by blacks, such as literacy tests and poll taxes. They built schools for black kids to keep us separate from the white schools. But to the lawyers in the room, they didn't quite make it on the equal thing, <laughs> giving us Dave's mom's textbooks that were old when she got them, and not even providing us our chemistry labs with the equipment and the materials that we needed in order to run our experiments. Little was expected of us. Little was invested in our education by the political structure. I was a good student. I studied hard. I thought that I should, should do this. I wanted to learn everything. There were lots of smart kids in my class, but they came from harder conditions than I did, and most of them didn't make it out. A terrible waste of talent. My life, as you heard, was very much shaped by the Civil Rights Movement. But maybe you would be surprised to know that my life was also shaped by the post-Sputnik race to space. Everything changed for me in the space of 10 months. The family church was bombed, Christmas night, 1956. A reminder that a happy childhood could still carry a lot of danger. I had no idea that this moment in my life, changed my life, had been captured until I saw the images in Spike Lee's movie, Four Little Girls, Robin Shuttlesworth, my grandmother, and me. Now, I talked about post-Sputnik. Sputnik was launched October 1957, and I heard that shout out for science. And I decided that I would rather listen to that than to the voices that were telling me that I, of what I couldn't do because I was black and female. Now, I'm sure that the people who were doing that call out, I wasn't exactly who they were looking for. <laughs> More likely these guys back here in the white shirts with the pocket protectors. <laughs> but I went anyway. I studied hard. I grew up. I left the South to go to college. I was only 16 when I graduated from high school. My parents would feel a little bit more comfortable if I went to college someplace closer to my family. And I had family in Seattle. Besides, there were no research universities that would realistically open to me below the Mason-Dixon line. I was a pre-med major. That's all I knew that you could do with science. And then I switched to zoology. And in the process of making that switch, I began to understand the importance of the idea of diversity. That led me in the pathway to a 
graduate school in science, and then became the precursor to an amazing career that I have been allowed to have at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. But I kept thinking, what about all those other smart kids that were there with me that didn't have the opportunities that I had had? What about all that talent that we left behind? We've got to stop leaving the talent behind. It's a terrible waste. We have so many needs and problems to solve, but we can't do it unless we take advantage of the talent. If you only remember one thing from my talk, it's this. There is talent going to waste all around us at a time when we desperately need talent. I've had a lot of time to reflect on Birmingham and those experiences and the experiences of the universities that I attend subsequently. And what I've come to understand is that the overt prejudices and barriers of the 1960s and 70s have just given way to the more subtle barriers that women and minority faculty and students still experience in the sciences in so many of our institutions. We have so many challenges that we need to address. So today, in 2015, we've got to make a decision as a nation. Do we choose to use the talent that is available or do we choose to give in to the stereotypes that talks about who does or does not belong? And if we give in to the stereotypes, how are we going to solve these 21st century problems? I know this is all sounding like ancient history. After all, I'm old. <laughs> but we can't just dismiss 1950s Birmingham as though, it's, as though it never happened. We have to remember that there is talent that is available all across this country, in every nook and cranny of this country. Talent that needs to be developed, that needs to be invested in. But then there's the reality. The reality is that our demographics are changing. So we are going to have a lot more people in our classrooms and in our workforce who are minority well over 50% of the students in college are women. So why aren't we using this talent? I've spent my career working on a lot of these issues really for four reasons. The first one is that I guess I take it personally and I wonder what would happen if somebody had ignored me as a possibility. The second, what, how are we gonna get the talent that we need? The third, Imagining a more peaceful and productive world if we're able to give people, offer them hope and a purposeful life. And finally, the shifting demographics that I talked about. We're not going to have the choice of leaving people behind. It's, we have the opportunity to use the lenses of different life experiences and take advantage of the diversity that we have. Make it an asset. But one of the things that we've got to do is basically start running away from the myths that keep this from happening. You know them, the myth of the math gene. You either have it or you don't. <laughs> A lot of you have said, oh, I was never good at math. But in any case, if your teachers believe it, they not, they're not going to teach you. If the students believe it, they're not going to try to learn. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So kill the math gene. The second myth is that of somebody, you, you, everybody can't do science. You know, imagine if you go into a classroom and the teacher at the front of the room says, half of you are not going to be successful in this class. Now, what is he saying? That he's not going to bother to teach me unless I already know this stuff? Talent is developed, is not just found. The third myth is the 
you don't look like a scientist. I probably don't to you. However, <laughs> an experiment was done almost 60 years ago by Margaret Mead and Rhoda Matro. And they asked, and was reported in science, and they asked the high school students to draw a picture of a scientist. Invariably, he looked like Einstein. Unfortunately, if you ask students to draw a picture of a scientist today, far too many of them draw the same thing. We've got to be prepared to see the possibilities all around us. We've got to understand that persistence is just as good as an SAT score and a lot better. I personally struggled in, in college. I'm willing to confess. I almost failed freshman chemistry lab. Why? All that stuff in Birmingham that I didn't get, I ran headlong into it. So I went to my, I was smart enough to go to my teaching assistant, who was the only African American graduate student in the entire department, and I said to him, I'm not dumb, I'm just underprepared. So he looked at my first quiz, nine out of 20. And he looked at my second quiz, seven out of 20. Clearly not the right direction. <laughs> but I convinced him I was salvageable. Next quiz, 18 out of 20, and he was happier than I was. But nobody, what if nobody ever thought that you were smart? What if you didn't think you were smart? What if people didn't look at you and see the possibilities? It's a terrible waste of talent. It's hard for you, but it's really hard for our country to lose this kind of talent. I've had a lot of experience being the only, the only black, the only woman, almost always the only African American woman. Even the only person trained in science, it's not something that's special and wonderful. It really is a, a challenge when you, people look at you and see that, think that you're a token. I think I bring something valuable into the room, a perspective that you are not otherwise going to get. I had to go through life without role models for what I wanted to be. I had to become something I had never seen. But we can make it different for other kids. We at AAAS run a program called the AAAS Lemelson Invention Ambassadors. It's made up of these wonderful, diverse people here, sending a message to people that these inventors and these innovators, they are 21st century problem solvers. They have the opportunity to tell a different message to the students and to the audiences such as you. These people are innovators and inventors as well, and these. At the end of the day, though, the important message here is that talent is developed and smart is something we become. Thank you.